Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 672. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's July 9th, 2021. All right, welcome to our Friday show. Friday, as you know, I hope you know, is a little more casual. We dress down, we don't really read the stories before we talk about them. We usually have coffee that we're drinking or diet soda or uh, whatever else is lying around and just sit down and, and, and talk about what's going on around the world. Not every story is gonna be about the Anglican church, thank God. Not every story will be Christian, holy cow. Sometimes we'll even talk about politics. It's Friday. It's a free-for-all. We do what we want. George, you just survived Elsa. Hours We're and hours of lucky. rain. <laughs> yeah. Very lucky. It stayed offshore when a hut was supposed to have uh, come ashore where we are, but went, uh, went ashore about 100 miles north, and so we only got rain, rain, rain. No flooding, no real wind, no trees down, nothing, no damage whatsoever, and just a little uh, leaks here and there in the church, which cleaned up nicely. I was just talking to one of my customers. She's the VP of the one of, and I have to tell you who they are. I don't need to be canceled. <laughs> but uh, she said, Kevin, and she lives in Florida, it's rained for 16 hours. I'm so sick of it. Said, yeah, that's usually what a, uh, a grade one tropical storm hurricane will do. It just sits there and, and let's go, George. In the background, I don't know if you can hear it, Kevin, we have the crop dusting planes coming by. The Mosquito Control Board oh, is coming by with their helicopters and planes bombing the county. Because if this is the time of year when, the, with all the standing water, the mosquitoes yeah. spawn, and they get so big down here, they carry off small children to their nests. And so if you hear a plane, low-flying plane buzzing, it's not the NSA uh, checking in on what we're saying. We're not gonna be canceled yet yet but it's no. just the mosquito control board yeah. we are cancelable but we can just move uh platforms to rumble or something else like that um before we get on to the news let me pull up our show notes here i think it's uh, important people know exactly what we're going to talk about <gasps> i don't have anything there george that's because like, it's a casual share, comment subscribe yes if you have not liked our show already and you know you're supposed to like us on youtube and facebook please like us share this program with friend and foe please go to the comment section and comment we love it when you do that if you're not subscribed yet please subscribe and if by chance you just don't want to sit and watch us talk on screen we have a podcast audio only format that you can listen to by going to the youtube show and clicking show notes okay george first story let's just go here to the anglican inc website and uh um, see what's what's here. Uh, well, we got one story on. we haven't put up yet about okay. Alabama Church Cathedral, the Advent in Birmingham. Sure. That that story has been unfolding. The dean Andrew Pearson resigned in May, and uh, we were in touch with Andrew at the time, and we decided really not to pursue it till sort of things shook out because I had so many questions, I really didn't know which way to jump. Well, Andrew Pearson resigned. He's been received by the ACNA. The Church of the Advent in Birmingham is the largest parish in the state of Alabama. I believe 3,600 people. It's big downtown cathedral. It's the powerhouse, but it's been at odds with the diocese. And the new bishop, Bishop Curry, she's a woman, I forget her first name, um, signed a concordat or covenant with the vestry of Church of the Advent, Cathedral of the Advent. Now this covenant basically forced the dean out. Uh, the dean, Andrew Pearson, told the Alabama, the Birmingham newspaper that he was asked to leave by the vestry because they wanted to go one way, he wanted to go another way. Advent had allowed parishioners to withhold their portion, well, withhold their pledges from getting sent up to the diocese. So if you gave $1,000 to the Advent and they kicked 10% upstairs, you could write on your pledge card, Advent only. Mm -hmm. So that meant instead of sending about 800000 a year to the diocese, which is a big, a lot of money, they only That's... said about 300000 yeah. Now, and the out diocese of Alabama is having money problems and is having declining membership. And the cathedral is at odds with the, 
the diocese. And so the new bishop, who was 67 when she was elected, She's only got five years to fix things. She has to retire when she's 72. Well, when we say she, at odds, that, you know, Alabama has gone progressive. You know, the Episcopal uh, Church. Yeah, the Episcopal Church the in churches. Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> Not Alabama. The Episcopal Church in Alabama, the diocese, has gone progressive. And it started way back in the mid-90s. It didn't. This isn't a, a brand new thing. And a lot of churches have struggled with in there. What do we do? Because we are in a conservative Alabama with a progressive diocese. And this is it. You see this in parts of the South. Actually, you see it in like Mississippi or Alabama, Mm -hmm. where the Episcopal churches were once very influential, very large, very popular. They've shrunk dramatically. And so they've decided to take a niche approach. We're going to be the church for the people who are ashamed from about being from Alabama. The, the people who subscribe to the New Yorker uh, in uh, uh, Fenwick City, uh, Alabama, and places like that. The people who want to be different from their neighbors. So they've jumped wholly on board the same-sex bandwagon and the, gay, and the liberal theology bandwagon. Now, and the result has been the diocese has been in a free fall. They had some defections to the ACNA at the start, and the Cathedral of the Advent was able, because it was the biggest uh, guy on the street by a factor of five or ten, mm-hmm. uh, has been able to insulate itself. And now they've reached a deal with the diocese. Now, here's the, what the deal says. The, the di- they've agreed not to allow people to withhold funding from the diocese in their giving. Now, internally, they'll probably have meetings to say okay they want 15 percent of our income we'll give them folks what do you say eight percent nine percent that'll still kick up a lot of money more money, money. yeah than they don't have second they agree to use the episcopal church prayer book and here's where it gets itch here's where it gets fuzzy for me under the dean andrew pearson they used a prayer book of his creation where the eucharist did not have an epiclesis or epiclesis. Depends where you went to school, how you you (laughs) use it. Now, in orthodoxy, when does the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ? That happens at the words of, at the epiclesis, where you put your hands, the priest puts his hands over the said, and you call down the Holy Spirit upon the bread and the wine. In the Catholic Church, the bread and wine become the body and bread of Christ at the words of institution. When you hold up, this is my body which was shed for thee, this is my blood. You hold that up. That's when it takes place. When does it happen in the Episcopal Church? We don't know. <laughs> and we're not going to nail The it word down. is still out. It could be at the words of institution. <laughs> it could be at the epiclesis or epiclesis. Uh, Andrew Pearson removed the epiclesis entirely that you have in the 79 prayer book. Mm -hmm. Now, the ACNA has one of those in their prayer book. They've not actually nailed down when the magic happens. I'm being silly, but when it happens. But you still need to use the ACNA prayer book, and he's gone over to the ACNA, Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how happy he'll be uh, not uh, using the ACNA's new liturgy. Yeah, it's it's one of those uh, strange, you know, normally we see a rector leave and take a portion, if not all, of the congregation with him to wherever his next journey takes him, uh, especially in the early days when the ACNA was in first formation uh, and before churches were wholeheartedly going all into Kenya or all into uh, Nigeria, Uganda, Truro uh, the, Parish, Falls yep. Church, boom, 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 things, boom. parishes like that. And this is yeah. a, an equivalent sized parish. Right. To see just a rector walk out and nobody following him, that's a little odd in my in my book, you know. Um, and to see the, the, you know, what kind of deal was made that he has to go and nobody's following him. That's just observationally, discerningly, that's odd. So. Now, we're not saying nobody, nobody, because. Yeah. His plans are to start an ACNA parish in Birmingham, Alabama. Cool. Now, if he gets 10%, 360 people to follow him, that's a good start. That's so a very that's good wonderful. start. Yeah. 
But we're not talking about Truro or Falls Church, where everybody, more or less, 90, 95% yeah. came. Sure. Yeah. And the vestry. So I've been loath to really push hard in this because, frankly, one of the, one of the neat things about the ACNA is the single issue cranks have all wound up in that church. So you've got guys who'll die in a ditch over how many ecumenical councils we have or uh, where we have the words of institution, where we have the epiclis, all this stuff. Now, good for you guys. That's exciting. That's fun. That's neat. Uh, and you've got all these Calvinists wearing plaid shirts and, and sculpted beards. Uh, Okay. Uh. No, no, but, but part of what you're saying is right. I mean, when the ACNA formed, um, a, I would say a good 10%, maybe 15% were just single issue people that, you know, were just finally ticked with the, the Episcopal Church at the time. They were going to get deposed anyway, and they ended up in the ACNA. Uh, the majority aren't that way. But there's enough in there that uh, I've run into these cranks at these conferences and they still have their single issue. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, the Eucharist is still a little different here in the AC. <laughs> it's like, you, you didn't, you, you, you have the same situation you had before because uh, the ACNA adopted so many of uh, the lit liturgy of the Episcopal Church. And you were mad at that at the Episcopal Church. You're going to be mad at that at the ACNA level as well. And, and here's like some of the spread. Um, and I'm not being critical, I'm being observational. Sure. There are some ACNA parishes that practice a form of open communion. By that, they think of the Eucharist as a form of welcome and inclusion. So you don't really have to be baptized. So in the seeker, seeker church section of the ACNA, we get reports of people, in ev all comers are invited to Holy Communion. Now, in the Diocese of Fort Worth, they have very firm, clear rules on this. You must be a baptized Christian. If you're not a member of this church or denomination, you must be a baptized Christian who receives communion in your own home church. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the outs with the Catholic Church and you, and you don't receive communion there and you're coming to the Episcopal Church here, Diocese of Fort Worth, eh, it's, in other words, there's such a range within the ACNA on some of these issues that uh, uh, good for them. I'm not going to comment <laughs> further. All right. As some of you may or may not be aware, uh, Bishop Stuart Ruck has asked Archbishop Foley for a temporary leave, and Archbishop Foley has granted that. We're going to talk as much as we can about the allegations and what's happened to get this far. And this is something that's happened in the ACNA, in the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. And this is something that I had no idea about before 10 days ago when we started to get some information coming from the diocese and coming from social media, uh, where this has been largely um, allegations that have come from people's Twitter's account as to what's happened at a church dealing with a uh, lay catechesis, a lay member who's uh, a teacher in the church, having um, alleged sexual uh, affair with one person. And uh, um, I, I don't know the regards to the other sexual allegations, but uh, it also involves children. This person was arrested by the police, uh, had served six months in jail, and was finally made bail. And the church and the diocese were, from what we can read here, were leaning on this going through the criminal courts and being taken care of that way. The diocese wanted to, from what we can read from the diocesan reports, minister to both the lay catechesis as um, uh, a member of the church and minister to the victims. <laughs> and in a such, chaos has broken out. Um, and we can only report on this as the allegations. Nobody has admitted to anything, and we have to be very careful how we talk about this because there are victims here of of, their, of sexual crime. And so, please uh, bear with George and I as we talk about what we know so far. George, what church is this from? 
Christ Our Light Anglican Church in Illinois in the Chicago suburbs. A lay catechist, as you said, is alleged to have committed several acts of sexual assault on women and a girl of the age of nine. This has not been adjudicated in a court of law, so these are, these are accusations at this stage. Mm -hmm. This has all sort of blown up because the victims have gone on to social media, Twitter in, in particular, to detail their accusations. And their accusations are against the, the abuser, also against the parish leadership, and also against the diocesan staff, and also against Bishop Rock. And their accusations are along the lines of they wanted to cover this up that at the lower levels and that the diocesan staff didn't know what they were doing. They fumbled the snap, so to speak, uh, and put as much emphasis in the victim's mind on reaching out to the abuser as they did to the abused. And Bishop Ruck did not act with the firmness and swiftness that they would have wanted him to have shown in this issue. Mm -hmm. They wanted the, the, the complainants wanted this to be very black, very white. Here's what's happening. Here's what the steps. Here is X, you know, here is the process. And the diocese appears to have wanted to be more pastoral in its handling of these issues. And what experience is shown in the Catholic and the Episcopal world and other church worlds is that doesn't work. You've got to be black and white on these things. And you can't have one person sort of ministering to both sides at the same time. Yeah, we have a situation where the accused and the victim are going to the same church. Um, you, this, is a, this is the number one reason you need to go and get a third party involved. Uh, as quickly as possible, because no matter what you do, you've, you've introduced yourself into a no-win scenario um, because of perceptions. You know, why are you talking to um, the the person who perpetrated this? You know, he, he just sexually abused somebody. Why do you have any interaction with him at all? Why aren't you uh, ministering to us? Um, and this is some of the allegations we see here on Twitter. Uh, just that perception that, you know, we're not being treated equally here. It's always good to have a hatchet man in the diocese. Uh, somebody who can basically get out the hatchet and chop off the wood and basically keep things on the up and up. Mm -hmm. And as I look at it from the big picture, the diocese of the upper Midwest hasn't done that. They've decided not to be, they've, well, I'll, I'll kick characterize this in another way this is a failing of the staff and its culture which has landed the bishop in trouble and the bishop at the end of the day the buck stops with him he did the right thing of stepping back of having another person oversee all this but he actually should have been on the ball more and making sure his staff was keeping him fully informed and up to speed and following the guidelines the national church had set down for them mm. This just speaks again why you have these routines and procedures that you know the ACNA lawyers spent a lot of time in writing their canons and experiences of other churches these things aren't just out there because they're a hobby of some lawyer rather it's shown what works and what doesn't work and when you don't follow them this is what happens yeah and this is not the first church that this has happened to you know we have hundreds of years of experience that tells us we have a step by step procedure we follow because of what we uh, experienced in those other churches. Well, you we know, can contrast this to, remember Kevin, about two years ago, Eric Manice, Manice in San Joaquin had a uh, similar type of crisis, except this time it was an ordained minister. Mm -hmm. And he handled this by the book. And because it was handled by the book, there was no, uh, what do you, what's the word? Uh, it worked. It was a dead, <laughs> bad situation that was resolved. I think he got one mention in Anglican unscripted. You know, yeah, because it, it, he, did, he, yeah. he he didn't he didn't fumble the ball. Yeah. He did the distasteful stuff that a bishop needs to do, yeah. and because of that, the situation was handled promptly, cleanly, and pastorally. 
it wasn't muddied. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess that's all I want to talk about for that subject this week. I hope that there can be a quick uh, solution. Um, but th this can is... Can I interject one thing? Sure. Every time we talk about this sort of stuff, people comment in the uh, comment that, Kevin George, you're so annoying because you're always smiling and happy and upbeat when you talk about such miserable things. Kevin, why are we smiling happy and upbeat when we talk about miserable things? Are we uh, just idiots or no, don't no. care? We, we see most situations, especially this one, as being redeemable. Okay, and we, we live in Christ's presence and uh, uh, it, it is our nature. This is the way God made me uh, with a smile on my face. He made me an optimist, a capitalist. And uh, this, is, this is what you get, even in the tough stories. And we've done tougher stories than this. And I generally don't have pathos on my faith because I know that God can redeem this. Absolutely um, right. So. And Kevin, I'm an optimist too. There's no way I could be a conservative Episcopal priest if I weren't an optimist. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So what other stories are we going to talk about here, George? I, uh, we to wanted that. to mention what's happening in Liverpool, in England, and their general synod and gay marriage. Sure. What What, what is happening? What else is happening? <laughs> Paul Bays is the Bishop of Liverpool, and Paul Bays has been sort of on the cutting edge. He's been the one diocesan bishop in England who's been willing to be public on his affirmation of same-sex marriage. Uh, he set up arrangements where the uh, assistant, uh, the suffragan bishop of Virginia, has been made assistant bishop in Liverpool, so she can, you know, come over and do stuff. And she's a firm supporter of gay marriage. And well, this past Sunday, a week ago Sunday, he gave a speech to a gay, gay, gay church pressure group, a lobbying group, Mosaic, I think it was called. Yep. And in his speech, he laid out the. Uh, reason that the Church of England must get with the times and must support gay marriage. It's the right thing to do with the majority of you, the people in the, in the country, so on. You, you, you know this stuff. And then he also was really nasty to conservatives, basically saying those, you know, slack jaw, knuckle dragon, <laughs> uh, troglodytes, um, just, you know, were too stupid to get it. Uh, and, you know, they, they've been too stupid in the past, and they're going to be stupid in the future. Well, this past week, Paul Bays announced his retirement. Uh, it wasn't because of his speech, but, but rather it was time. And he's going out and he's now has no fear of being public on his views. But he also decided, well, perhaps I was wrong in being so mean to you stupid conservatives. There, there, little man, I'll pat you on the head and say I didn't mean to be as mean as I was. So General Synod is facing uh, the... Uh, gay marriage issue, indirectly and directly, through bishops breaking ranks with uh, Justin Welby, who wants everybody to be in the middle model. We've seen tweets. Uh, 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 reader, our viewers and friends in the UK have sent us picked photos of tweets and Facebook posts of one priest says, I've already booked my first same-sex wedding for next summer. Let's hope Synod does the right thing. So you've got churches all set to go ahead and it'll probably be the Episcopal situation. If they don't do it, these churches will still go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we saw in the Episcopal Church, that go, you know, go ahead until and they us. catch up with us. Yeah. So, and with the Methodists uh, backing gay marriage, um, conservatives, traditional marriage advocates in the Church of England feel a little lost because the uh, leadership is trying to have it both ways but allowing the bad boys to get away with everything while holding the uh, the other bad boys uh, very tightly under control. Hmm. Do you remember uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, put out his, uh, I'm embarrassed by all the anti-Semitics here in England taking to the streets. And I saw you post a story on Anglican Inc. about the chief rabbi denouncing Cape Town's Archbishop for being an anti-Semite. And I thought that's a good thing to talk about for our next story, George. Tabo Makoba is the Archbishop of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Tabo Makoba is the darling of the left in the United States and in the UK. He is on their side firmly. And not only that, 
he is able to dissemble and mumble and speak out of both sides of his mouth. He's a firm supporter of the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. He said next to nothing about the expropriation of lands for white farmers and the murder of white farmers in South Africa. Uh, he basically toes the government line on every issue. He's a politician. He's not a man of God. And this is another example. There's a very strong anti-Israel element in South African society. And the Synod, and there's some South African church people who are quite vociferously anti-Israel, anti-Semitic. Well, Tabo Makoba put out a statement condemning Israel's recent Gaza war as being uh, as bad as, worse than apartheid, and you know, Israel is a racist state, and all these sorts of things you hear from, you know, college cranks on the university campuses these days who hate Israel. Well, the chief rabbi responded uh, saying, hey, hey, you know, fella, get a grip, grow up. It, you know, Israel has uh, Arabs in all parts of its government, all, you know, there is Arab uh, generals, Arab ambassadors. It's the one place where uh, Muslims and non-Muslims in the Middle East are treated with equality. That's right. And, you know, if you ask an Israeli Arab, do you want to be part of the Palestinian state? 90% say no way. 99%. Then, since, uh, <laughs> and then he goes on to say, and here you're back, and the chief rabbi said, you're backing Hamas. Now, you know, Hamas is the one responsible for supporting the jihadist violence and murder in no northern Mozambique, which is in your province. And in your province, you have 700,000 refugees from Islamist terror. And you say nothing. You say nothing. You just issue these sort of, oh, isn't it terrible? Gosh, golly gee, maybe if we gave him mosquito nets, they wouldn't kill people. So it's the statements. That's hyperbole, of course. Yes. And so the chief rabbi is basically saying, you know, this reflexive anti-Semitism from the left. And that's really where it's coming from, from the political and theological left. Uh, Anti-Zionism has really crossed the line into anti-Semitism and the refusal to condemn jihadism because it might look to be supporting Israel in some way. Yeah. And the chief rabbi says that's not a position of integrity. Yeah. Not for the church. And uh, this would be something really wonderful to have the Archbishop of Canterbury speak on. Because uh, we can't have it in the streets of London. We cannot have it in the Anglican Communion uh, anywhere, especially South Africa. Uh, a couple other stories I wanted well, here to talk about. This is yeah. the week. Well, this is the weakness of Justin Welby. Yeah. He's willing to speak on a localized one-off issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, some Palestinians driving around Golders Green in the Jewish, traditionally Jewish parts of London, you know, ye yelling death to the Jews. That's bad. People doing it in Durban or Cape Town. That's not my business. Can't speak to that. Nope. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. You and I talk uh, frequently in short sentences about the corruption of India and then we stop because it's it's a very corrupt uh, government it's a very corrupt society and it's kind of just baked into everything there is one country or a couple countries actually that I can think of that are worse than Indian corruption and one would be Haiti and Haiti just had a assassination of the president and the Episcopal Church's presiding bishop, Michael Curry, put out a pastoral message to the people of Haiti. I thought we could talk about that real quick and talk about Haiti. Yeah, I think it was Tuesday night, uh, Juvenal Moise, mm -hmm. or Moses in French, uh, the president of Haiti, was murdered in the presidential palace and his wife was shot and was airlifted to Miami in critical condition by... Uh, assassins and the police have arrested six people including two ha Amer Haitians who hold American citizenship and evidently the police are saying this these were mercenaries who were hired to kill the president now Moises uh, is a controversial figure he canceled elections and has been ruling by decree for the last two years uh, and is basically a dictator and the United Nations Security Council earlier this year condemned his rule and urged him to return to free and fair elections. In Haiti, that's a bit of a, a pie-in-the-sky thing. Haiti has been 
is Haiti is in the Somalia level of dysfunction. The country is, if you look at satellite maps of the island of Hispaniola, you look at Santo Domingo with its forests and fields and valley, it's green. You look at Haiti, it's brown because all the forests have been cut down, it's deforested, it's erosion, the soil is all gone. And the people have left their farms to move into the slums of Port-au-Prince and other cities. It's a miserable place with some very wealthy people, by yeah. the way. And the wealthy have always been wealthy and the poor have always been poor. And we've now got the presiding bishop giving a polite but anodyne statement without mentioning the murdered president. Uh, the Episcopal Church in Haiti is pretty big, relatively speaking. I think it's the largest diocese in terms of members in the Episcopal Church. Uh, but that's actually been a little dysfunctional where the last Episcopal election was set aside because of vote buying and pressure and things like that. So the corruption that you see in the hate in the Haitian government, where you don't get government services unless you pay the civil servant, you, you know, if you've ever been to Haiti, it's not uncommon to have roadblocks and you get through the roadblock by just, you know, having the, the policeman with the machine gun. Yeah. Uh, you, you could have, uh, you know, 50 pounds of heroin in the back seat, but you know, five bucks will get you through anything. And unfortunately, that worldview has infected the church in some places. Now, there are Episcopal leaders who are trying to clean that up. And Michael Curry has been in the forefront of that. Um, but it's just, you know why people want to leave Haiti, and I don't blame them. Well, 11 years ago, they had the, the Haiti earthquake uh, that really wiped out. I think uh, 300,000 were injured. Um, 220,000 were killed in the earthquake. And George... W. Bush and Bill Clinton took to the skies and traveled all over America and the world raising money. And in all, $13.5 billion were raised for earthquake uh, aid to Haiti. I assure you, only a small portion of that money ever made it to the aisle. And, uh, you know, the, the corruption to take it, 13 billion dollars and just make it go poof uh it's not just at, at a haitian level it was you know obviously at, a, at clinton levels too but you know this is an island that's always suffered from that level of corruption yeah, there were allegations that uh, mass this money raised was very little of it actually filtered down to the people of haiti mm -hmm. hillary clinton's brother was given the cell phone uh monopoly for haiti yeah. And with a country that doesn't have telephone wires, the cell phones are ubiquitous. And it is alleged that monies were given to the Clinton Foundation. You know, it was all, it's dirty. And uh, the Obama Justice Department declined to look into this any further. And basically, the people got away with uh, stealing billions. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans well, yeah. and well-connected Haitians stealing billions of people billions of dollars. USAID, which is a uh, um, organization here in America, uh, did an audit of everything, and they said one cent of every dollar made it to the Haitian island that was donated for. And that's about right. I would say it's that's probably generous. But you, you just look at you that. Know, where where did it, it go? Speaks to, well, we know where it went. Uh, it, uh, it speaks to the... Uh, the corruption of our Justice Department these yeah. days yeah. and the FBI, that we can have all these government reports and we can have all these investigative news reports and nothing happens if it's a politically well-connected person. Mm -hmm. And then for people who are not politically well-connected, who are not uh, part of the elite, you know, the book is thrown against them. Um, this Michael Avenatti guy who tried to... Uh, uh, basically shake down Nike, the shoe company, for millions and millions and millions of dollars. He finally was sentenced today, and he was guilty as hell. He was on tape and everything. He got 30 months in prison. I have a parishioner who was sentenced to five years in prison for stealing 900 bucks. You know, yeah. there's one level of justice for the poor person who wasn't 
who did a stupid thing and stole 900 bucks gets five years in prison in Florida where a total corrupt clown can try to steal tens of millions of dollars through extortion, he gets less than two and a half years. Yeah. In a nice prison. That's justice in the United States. In a yeah. nice prison. You know, yeah. you know, in a nice prison with air conditioning. Yeah. Not in a Florida, you know, Florida prison farm. Uh, with, we still have chain gangs in Florida in certain parts of the state. Yeah. They're the worst offenders. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned the Clintons. You know, the corruption with the Haitian thing, that went all the way to the U.N., you know, they, they track the money there, and it got bounced around to uh, countries who promised to help, but never showed up. So, you know, that it's a sad situation. It's very sad to see that the leader was assassinated. But I think Haiti is in such a bad situation, like we talked about before, that may not be redeemable. That may not be fixable. Because um, nobody there wants what's best for Haiti. They always want what's best for them. And when that occurs, you're going to find this continue recycling of the evils that happen on that aisle. So, oh, George, that was a depressing story, <laughs> like so many today. Let's smile, Kevin. Let's. Well, here's, here's <laughs> yeah. the sad thing, folks. Yeah. If we talked about this 30, 40 years ago, we could talk about the Tonton Makuts and Baby Doc and Papa Doc That's and right. Voodoo. Oh, I'm sad to say that there's no voodoo element in this one anymore. No. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Papa Doc Duvalier and his son, Baby Doc, kept the island in a dictatorship and enforced their rule through fear from voodoo. Uh, we don't, it's, we, so we don't even have interesting uh, evil and corruption anymore. We just oh. have okay, garden well. variety American lawyers stealing <laughs> from poor people. Here, here's a good story that we have at Anglican.inc. Um, and it's almost a good story, except it's not really a good story. Bishops back women's Down syndrome legal challenge to Britain's abortion laws. So as you guys know, uh, Down syndrome has been wiped out completely in many European countries, um, but not for the right reasons. And the bishops here have come to the defense of Down syndrome. Whoa, that's a good story. There's not been a Down syndrome baby in Iceland, I think, for five or six years. And I think it may be that way in Denmark and in yeah. Scandinavian countries. And most of the Scandinavian countries allow for uh, genetic uh, diagnosis. And if you have Down syndrome, you are perfectly legally able to abort your baby. And encouraged to do so. And encouraged, yeah. And a uh, woman with Down, a, a Down syndrome advocate in the UK is mounting a legal challenge to Britain's abortion laws, which allow you, for the reason of Down syndrome alone, to kill the child, terminate the, the, the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And to the credit of some individual bishops of the Church of England, they have lent their support to this woman's campaign. Uh, the Church of England is not as squarely on abortion as they are on other issues. Rowan Williams was quite strong in his opposition to abortion. That was one of his strong points. Um, Justin Welby really hasn't said much one way or the other. And a few years ago, we had a big fracas where we had a correspondent of Anglican Inc. attack uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Helen's uh, Bishop's Gate for not being more activist on abortion. And that was a 90-day wonder as well. But the Church of England has done a better job, and I think we should uh, give credit where credit is due to say these men and women individually have uh, lent their support to a campaign to stop a horrid practice, mm -hmm. which is murdering children for what some can, in the name of eugenics, of a building a perfect society by getting rid of all the unfit. The Nazis used to do this. They called it was the T4 program, where That's they right. would kill those those who were uh, mentally. Uh, we used to say mentally retarded or had birth defects or had Down syndrome because their life was not worth living. Life, uh, I forget the German phrase, but it was life without life. Mm -hmm. uh, they were living, but they were not having a full human life because of their disabilities. It was kinder to rid society of the cost of caring for them. It was kinder to them to kill them. And we have this attitude in certain European countries uh, towards those with Down syndrome. It's kinder to kill them and to, than to allow them to live and to be a burden on the state and their families. 
Well, we actually take it many steps further, which is sad. All abortion is evil. It's wicked. It's not just aborting those with Down syndrome. We've used the escape that, you know, they're unwanted. Society doesn't want them. The parents don't want them. The church doesn't want them. An unwanted child is just as uh, unwanted as a, a child with Down syndrome. And we just want to be sure that we can raise this world to not have unwanted people in it. And all abortion is evil. And I, I appreciate the first little itty bitty step the bishops here have taken, but I implore them to take the bigger step uh, and know that there are nothing in God's creation that is unwanted. And these are God's creation. So, George good show this week even though we had nothing to talk about we were we did a half hour ago sitting around what do you want to talk about i don't know I, just, I, I don't know you know so good show tough topics um but we smile because we know most of this except maybe haiti is redeemable i'm kevin colson and i'm george conger and everything i think kevin can be redeemable in christ's love Amen. There, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> and then you've been watching episode 672 of Anglican Unscripted.